I was asked to talk about the role or the relationship between social media and elections. And what I want to talk about today is what I found sort of most interesting or the most interesting digital politics story that took place during the 2015 election. And it probably isn't what you think. When we talk about the relationship between social media and um, elections, we often talk about, about the positive developments that it can have for electioneering. And the sort of model case is Barack Obama in 2008, where he's really held up as the full potential of the technology and election campaign. You can bring in new people, you can raise small, uh, small, uh, small dollar donations, and it really can have this effect on the outcome. And much of the discussion post-2008 in Canada has been about whether or not Canadian political actors can have or will use social media in that way. And there are some that would suggest that Justin Trudeau did so in 2015. I think that's debatable. But I'd like to talk about a different side of social media that emerged in the 2015 election. And that is the large number of candidates uh, who, through comments made on social media or actions captured on social media, were, had to resign and or uh, apologize during the campaign. And so just a couple of examples. So um, a liberal candidate in Alberta was, uh, had to drop out of the race after comments that she had posted on uh, Twitter four years ago had surfaced. Uh, another conservative candidate in Toronto uh, also resigned due to com uh, YouTube videos of him making crank calls uh, pre in, previous, in previous campaigns, in previous years. Um, several other candidates were forced to, forced to apologize for comments and actions made on social media, including an NDP candidate who was rebuked for uh, disrespectful comments about Auschwitz. And so from what I can gather, there was about 13 to maybe 50 candidates during 2015 that got in trouble or and they resigned during that election. And what I find sort of interesting is that the, the media made a big deal about these. These became national news stories. These were on CBC, the Globe and Mail, uh, they're on you know, the, National uh, the National Post, so really got a lot of media attention, and the parties were forced to, to uh, address these and taking them off message. So the candidates had to sort of either apologize, leaders had to address these issues. And I think that there's a couple of interesting things about these stories. The first one is, is that Despite the, the way the media sort of frames this, is that they seem to have forgotten that this is not a new story. That um, this is not actually has anything to do with social media particularly. And in fact, Canadian candidates have been used for several election cycles, have learned the hard way that the internet does not forget. Um, so I, you know, a couple of days ago, went into ProQuest and put in uh, elections, candidates, um, social media, or web, or internet, and just sort of see what it came up with. So in 2011, a Green candidate, part, uh, candidate had to resign over a quotation on, about rape on his Facebook page. In 2008, about eight candidates uh, were embarrassed over comments made on, online. In 2005, a Liberal Party uh, official was forced to step down in which he had created a blog post. You remember this, the separated at birth. So it was a picture of a Chow Chow dog and Jack Layton's wife, Olivia Chow, and the underlying headline, Separated at Birth. And the oldest one that I can find was a discussion in the 2004 election uh, of, a, of a candidate who had made some anti-Semitic comments on a website um, in which he was asked, and he was asked to resign. And I'm almost positive if I looked really hard, I could probably find one from, 2004, from the 2000 election, but I haven't found one yet. And we also see examples of this in the provincial elections, so we saw the Lake of Fire in Alberta a couple years ago, and also in Alberta, the dead of driver situation in which uh, posts uh, from uh, previous years had sort of come up and sort of, had sort of caused problems. So I think that there's a couple of comments I'll make about this. One, it's not new. That this is really not about social media per se, it's really about the internet. And what's interesting to me is that the same characteristics that we think are really positive about the internet and the things that we draw on that are going to be great for democracy, <coughs> so the interactive capabilities of the internet and also the ability for everyone to have a say in democracy are the things that are getting candidates in trouble. So it's the flip side of the things that we think are really, really important for democracy. The second thing I think is really interesting to talk about with vis-a-vis -vis these, 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 these stories is where do these stories come from in the first place? Because when you read these stories, it just sort of 
miraculously happens that the media knows about these stories. And one of the things interesting is that when we talk about the relationship between social media and digital technologies and politics, we always sort of talk about it in the context of sort of democratic engagement between parties and officials. Uh, so between parties and citizens. Okay, well that's interesting, except for there's a lot of audiences for online material, right? There's a lot of people looking at what's online. So that includes interest groups and organizations, that includes journalists, and that includes the opposition. And we don't really talk about, so we think about the, you know, the 900,000 people who follow Justin Trudeau on Twitter. How many of those are conservatives? They have no interest in engaging with Justin Trudeau in a fundamental way about democracy. Who are just there waiting to see Justin Trudeau say something that is going to be right for discussion. And journalists and opposition are aided and are, are aided and are and so the digital technology both aids and facilitates research done by journalists and opposition. And so I want to talk briefly about the concept of opposition research, um, or oppo research as it's called sort of in the, sort of the campaigning uh, literature. And so opposition re research refers to efforts by a campaign to investigate an opponent, both their professional, their private, and their public lives. And these observations about the opponent are key parts of, an, of a political strategy. And the purpose of opposition research is not only to look for gotcha moments, if they happen, that's amazing, but it's also there to look for contradictions in what co candidates are saying, and then to bring them attention to, uh, to reporters. And this is not new. Opposition research has existed as long as there's been campaigns. But one thing you see today is it's highly professionalized. And so in the United States, um, you have huge firms like America of Rising or American Bridge 21st Century that conduct opposition research on behalf of the Republicans and the Democrats. And this is a, these are million dollar uh, businesses. Digital technologies have changed opposition research in a number of ways. So first, as more and more of us are living our lives online, we create a digital trail of the things that we've said and pictures and videos of the things that we've done. Now all of us probably have some of those things that are rather dumb, and some of them are rather really, really dumb. But this is right for opposition research. Um, and so the things that have ha happened before people become candidates, therefore become part of this digital legacy in which that can be searched and, and found. Even when people just choose to become a politician, it means that everything that they say and do also goes online. And so therefore, all of politicians' lives are also lives online as well, and so the opposition has the ability to systematically search for contradictions on a regular basis. Search engines like Google um, basically make it easy for anyone to find this information about opponents, and then computer technologies make it easier for you to create databases which can be sorted and searched regularly and easily. And we know from interviews that I've done and others have done with party operatives that they are monitoring the opposition. Um, they're, on, they're on their websites, they're on their social media pages, uh, and they're paying attention. But one of the things that digital technology does is it does lead to an amateurization of opposition research. And what I mean by that, it means anyone that's rather sympathetic to a party or a candidate is able to conduct it. Um, and so when I was looking at one of the, the examples from the Liberal Party of uh, the Liberal Party of Alberta, the, uh, the Alberta woman from, you know, the tweet was from some person who sort of sent it out. I don't know who this person is. I'm going to assume that uh, this person was a conservative, but I don't know. The, the idea that was probably within the party is probably not that true. And so what we see is that, so where opposition research was largely the monopoly party organize, uh, organizations, now freelancers are out there and are able to do it. And some of them are probably able to do it better than parties. Digital technology also provides a tool by which this stuff can be disseminated. So the goal eventually would be this to be shared with journalists, um, and they may choose to or to not write stories about this. But even if they choose not to write this, digital technology provides you a way to A, share the technology yourself, or to share it with sympathetic Twitterers or bloggers who are more than happy to post this information so that it can be found. So digital technology uh, makes opposition research easier. It's easier to find, it's easier to sort, it's easier to search, and it's easier to share. It's basically faster, and it's, more, it's quicker, and it's less expensive.
And so this is sort of a, sort of maybe an unattended consequence of the same types of things that we think are really positive for democracy when we talk about technology. So I'm just going to conclude with, I think, two, uh, two implications and then one sort of, sort of thing that I wonder about. My first conclusion is related to Canadian politics specifically, that, and related to what uh, uh, Professor Coop was talking about yesterday. I find it really interesting that these stories have brought the local campaign into the national spotlight, and not in a good way. And that previous research has generally shown that national news doesn't pay attention all that much to local campaigns. You know, unless you have a high profile candidate or a close race, but generally most of the, the literature that looks at, um, looks at elections finds that the dominant narrative is national news and the local campaign is something of, the, of a blind spot for the media. Um, and then usually what would happen is that if in previous campaigns if a, camp, if a candidate made, said something sort of off message or off color, it would be in a local news story, but it wouldn't be national news. Today, that's just not the case, and that's what we saw in 2015, that you have, you know, basically minor candidates that are not particularly important becoming several-day stories in national newspapers. And so the story of the, uh, the liberal candidate, she was against, I, I, checked, I, didn't, I didn't realize who she was against, she was against Michelle Rempel. She was never going to win. Does it really matter that, that this woman made these comments four years ago? In the grand scheme of this election, probably not. Michelle Rempel won with 60% of the vote. But yet, here we do, we have a, a three-day story in which a national party leader has to address of a sort of rather inc inconsequential candidate. I think that that's fascinating. So that's, I think, is a change to the way that media will cover campaigns. The other implication, and I think this is an implication for us as, sort of as, as, as people who use social media, but this relation, this, like, this reminder that social media is not a private, it's not a private space. And for politicians, it's not a private space between he, him or her and their constituents. It's a place where politicians are always on the record. And I think the inevitable consequence of this will be that politicians will, begin, will, that politicians will control the message online as well as offline. And what we learn is that politicians need to watch what they type. And, the and then what, what, what this means is that the types of messages that we'll see on social media and digital technologies are going to be less engaging and less interesting than we would want them to be that they're probably going to be less interactive and less in the moment because the consequences of doing so is actually dangerous. So this idea that people are going to be in, uh, in, uh, in sort of, you know, sort of interesting debates with citizens online, yep, uh, just seems that this was, is just really unlikely. So the thing that I wonder about, so going forward, is this idea of what happens, so, it, so you know, People now have a short digital leg legacy, or a short, short digital history, or digital trail. What happens in 10, 15, 20 years when you have people who have lived their entire lives on social media and on the internet, and probably definitely have said really dumb things, and have videos of really dumb things online? How does that change what candidate look, looks like in 25 years? Does this, will this even matter? You know, and I think back to sort of the, you know, the issue of sort of marijuana and politicians, right? 25 years ago, you know, someone using marijuana in college is, was still a really big deal. Now it's just kind of like, eh. it, Do we get to a point where somebody's racist comments at 16 becomes just kind of a, meh, because that just is sort of what happens on social media and there's a sort of forgiving of that over time. But I have no idea, it's just something that I wonder about. But those are my comments about the role of social media and sort of some interesting ideas of where this technology fits in, uh, in Canadian election campaigns. So thank you. So one of the earliest sort of claims about the internet was this idea of disintermediation, the idea that sort of intermediaries were going to become less important because we were going to be able to have all of this sort of direct, either direct democracy or direct connect connections. And I think the opposite has actually happened. I think what has happened is that we've made intermediaries more important. So we were talking about pollsters yesterday. Well, why are pollsters, you know, in this place where we have all, you know, everyone can say what they want on Twitter, all this kind of stuff. It means that pollsters, we need pollsters to figure some of this out. I think the media also becomes more important in this 
age, despite the fact that we thought for a really long time, well, everyone's going to be able to say what they want, everyone's going to be a publisher, it's going to move away from, yeah, and the media has changed, absolutely. I mean, newspapers are in trouble, and, but the idea of the role that journalists of being the people who, that selection and that curation that they do is super important. And I think that, um, again, I don't think that people who were writing about the internet in the 90s would have foreseen that journalists and pollsters would become more important. But I think that they are really more important now because of exactly what you suggested, that there's just so much out there that we need people to, and again, some of the technology does that. Yeah. Yeah, so you need people. And the, and the other thing I think that's also at play here is also technology, right? So technology also becomes a curator. So trending, Google, these things also become places by which they tell us what's important in the world. Um, and that's interesting for a number of reasons, not, you know, not at the least that none of that stuff is, um, is, 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 no, is, is neutral. I mean, Google's algorithms, uh, Twitter's algorithms, these are made for particular things, right? So they're going to be curated by businesses for business reasons, but we don't think about that, right? So I think that that's also going to be another sort of uh, layer, which is the role that technology plays in trying to tell us what is really happening. Let's bring the, the stuff up to the top. Um, but it's, yeah, but I think that intermediaries also become really, really important. Uh, I mean, yes and no. I mean, it's at the same time, it's really easy to ignore, right? Like, you know, you know, I'm interested in, you know, so again, the sort of thing that they talked about early in the, in, early in the internet age, which was this idea of echo chambers and sort of cyber balkanization. It's really easy to just be like, I just don't care about these 200 million people who are talking about Blake. Right. I'm, just, I, I'm just not, I'm just not going to go with that hashtag. Right. I don't know about it. Right? At the same time, the technology just makes it really, really easy to, so yeah, I think that there's a, it's a, yes, there's lots of information out there, and yes, if you really, really care, yes, you can get involved in that, but if you don't, you could spend, you know, a happy, happy day never knowing what the main trending hashtag is, and life would be fine. So it's, so it's, a, it's a bit of both. I am not convinced in any way, shape, or form that people use social media to, com to communicate with young people. I, there's no evidence to suggest that that's true to me. Um, I get that there's young people out, uh, that are online, and I get that there's politics and there's content, but the idea that th these two things just exist in the world do not mean that they're the same thing, right? So Hillary Clinton is just using technology, and if you happen to be the person who's, at the, at the, who's getting it, then it's for you, right? So. The same tweet, if I'm, if I'm following Hillary Clinton on Twitter and you're following Hillary Clinton on Twitter, it's the same tweet, right? It's only in some areas, like some of the stuff they do in, in, on Facebook, where there's a little bit of micro-targeting, but it's not going to be on the main page. It'll be in the ads and the other types of content where they're going to target to you. But it isn't going to be in those sort of broad-based Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, broadcasting. That's what's going on there, and that's for everybody. Those types of messages are for everybody. It isn't until you get into the more narrower um, social media. So when you know Barack Obama was using, he's going to some of these sort of um, the sites that you know so that that uh, that African Americans use. Then you start to see the more targeted content. But there really isn't that for sort of young people, um, and so. I think the, the accurate, you know, so the, sort of the observation that she's sort of trying too hard is like, it, it, in some ways it's fair because I don't think it's actually, actually intended any way to try to be sort of cool or hip. I think that they just realize that they've got to do it and if they don't do it they're going to be sort of you know, accused as sort of old and fuddy-duddy and all of these types of things. Um, I mean, Bernie Sanders is just an interesting case, right? He, and I think it has, again, it's sort of, out, sort, sort of outside of technology that makes him an interesting case. In the same way about Barack Obama, and I think that one of the big sort of, one of the issues with sort of understanding the Barack Obama um, success is that there's so many things that possibly could have made him successful that we're unable to entangle. I don't know if it's technology. I suspect it's not, but it could have been. But it could have been that he was, you know, sort of 
this first African-American person. It could have been his great oratory skills. It could have been the message for change. How we untangle all of those to decide what was the, the dominant factor is, I, I'm not really sure. I mean, the narrative is that he is, it's technology. I don't, if, I was gonna bet my, if I was a betting woman, I would say it probably wasn't, really, at the end of, at the, end of the day. Um, so I think your observation is right that sort of the, the use of technology um, is, I, I, I think the other place that you'll see sort of more targeted, targeted messages would be email. So I would, I would rest assured that an email that I would get from Hillary Clinton won't be the email that you would get from Hillary Clinton, right? That they can, because you would provide information ahead of time. So that, that, you'll, so that they're going to try to provide different types of messages to us on that front. But it isn't the broad-based open technologies. It's the much more narrow, the ones that we're not going to see. And so we know a lot about Twitter because it's easy to study. We don't know a lot about, it, about email and how politicians use email because it's almost impossible to study. Because when I go in to, to, uh, to sign up for email, they're going to ask me information. And I have no way of knowing whether or not if you go and put email, your email address in and your information that you're going to get anything similar to mine. And so it's a bit of a black box. So I think the targeting happens, but I don't think it happens on Facebook. Uh, it doesn't happen on Facebook pages and on Twitter feeds. It happens in email and it happens in uh, the types of messages you get on the side of your, of your Twitter feed. Those types of, uh, and Facebook, those types of messages, because that stuff can be found out through uh, the same types of things, ways that marketers target information to you. So your Google, your, your Google searches, all of that kind of information is being sold to politicians for that reason. But again, how we are really not going to be able to have a handle on that because it's going to be so individualized for all of us. I mean, unless it's tied into something that you're talking about, so part of a broader sort of exercise of democratic engagement, I think, I think the answer is no. Right? Like, I mean, which is, you know, I was trying to think, I'm um, just thinking about some of the da data that I have with uh, Harold and Royce, and, you know, you know we're looking at 20% of people who have been, you know, who have been to a party website in the last year, right? So that's well under the amount of people who voted, right? So almost 70% of people voted, but, you know, I don't know, were the numbers different in, for that in, in the, over the election? A little bit higher, so yeah, so no, but not higher than 30? Right, so you, get, so you still have 70% of people who voted, but not, but 40, but not even 30% actually visited a party website in the election before, right? So this is not the, like, you know, so again, all of these sort of democratic rhetorics about the internet, and you know, it's, it, I think, as you said, you know, you know, it's for those hyper, you know, hyper, those people who are really, really engaged. It's a great, amazing, wonderful tool. And I think the problem for all of, I think the, the issue that we have, sort of as political scientists and political science students, is that we are the worst people to judge this. Because we, of course we're going to use it, and of course this is going to happen. It's just so obvious. I love politics. I have a phone. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. But, like, but it just is not, like, we are the, you know, we are the most, we are the worst people to be the, the, the sort of the assessors of whether or not this is going to matter. Because, you know, you need to go to find the person who's like, no, I love Kim Kardashian, and I follow her every tweet. And can technology allow me to change that into something else, right? And that's really, you know, I think that that's really where it sort of breaks down for me, because it's very important for lots of people in a lot of ways. But if politics is not, you know, Kim Kardashian, and, you know, and the importance of things in my life, I pick Kim Kardashian over national politics, well, that's what I'm going to follow. And for lots of people, that's the case.